All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome on behalf of Hogan Lovells. I'm delighted to kick off and welcome you all to our FDI, FSR, and Outbound Investment Screening webinar. If you even read the headlines overnight, uh, we couldn't be more timely to have this conversation today. Just a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. CLE is being offered, and I will provide the code at the end of the session. We will send you uh, CLE forms as well as a link to this webinar after this session. And so without further ado, let's get started. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Mavesh Qureshi. I'm an M&A partner at Hogan Lovells based in the Washington DC office. I'll be serving as your moderator today. And now our subject matter experts. I'm delighted to be here with my partners, um, you, who you'll see on the screen, starting with Ann Saladin, who's a partner in the Washington DC office and assists foreign and domestic clients in various industries on matters involving national security and cross-border transactions, in particular before the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States, or CFIUS. Anne spent nearly 20 years of service to the Office of the Assistant General Counsel for International Affairs of the Treasury Department, which provides legal advice to the Secretary of the Treasury as chairperson of CFIUS. Recently, Anne was listed by Foreign Investment Watch as one of the top advisors on CFIUS in 2023, I know I have her on speed dial for all my M&A matters on Tetsifius. <laughs> Next, Falk Schoening, another person who's on my speed dial. He's a partner in both our Berlin and Brussels offices and advises clients on all aspects of EU and German antitrust law, EU state aid, foreign investment control and export control. And he focuses practice on international cases which require coordination between different legal systems or representations vis-a-vis -vis several regulators. Falk regularly advises clients on structuring transactions, joint ventures or divestitures, and represents them in merger control and foreign investment control proceedings to ensure M&A transactions are successfully closed. Last but certainly not least, Francesco Pili. He's a counsel in the Brussels office and concentrates on the EU competition law and litigation. He has substantial experience in the field of state aid law, having assisted companies and public entities and organizations in several high profile EU commission investigations and related litigation before the EU courts in matters concerning tax optimization, regional aid, and COVID-19 related aid measures. So without further ado, let's dive in for the reason you're here today. Let's start with foreign direct investments or FDI screenings. Falk, there seems to be a lot of chaos in foreign investment control in the headlines. Can you get, help us have some order to that chaos? Is, is it the case that China is a new and interesting development in the, in the scope of these headlines? Have the geopolitical tensions intensified to the point that any control transaction or acquisition by a Chinese investor in the EU would likely receive enhanced FDI scrutiny? Yeah, well, thanks, Mavish, for that question, and hi, everyone. Um, I think that is a question that you can uh, answer twofold. China certainly was one of the reasons why foreign investment control has seen such a massive surge uh, in Europe, in the U.S., and in a couple of other jurisdictions in the last few years. But it's not the only one, and I think it would be too narrow if we focused uh, only on the importance of foreign investment control for Chinese acquirers. So I'm, I'm happy in the next few minutes to cover the Chinese aspect, but I would also like to um, talk a bit about what it means for basically all international transactions. Because what you can see here on this first uh, slide, which shows indeed the, the chaos if you want, because it's uh, so many different newspaper articles, um, there are a couple of transactions which do not involve Chinese players, if you Think of the uh, failed takeover in France of Carrefour by a Canadian buyer. That's just an example um, which shows this is not one directional. Recently, just a few weeks ago, Denmark has issued its first FDI prohibition, and that was against the Japanese acquirer. So I think it um, is something that really requires um, the attention of all parties to, to global deals. And in order to structure the chaos a bit, uh, we can move to the next slide because I'm, I'm coming up here with a proposal of how you can think about it in terms of risk. And uh, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I hadn't uh, a, a caveat, which you see here on the slide. Uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of jurisdictions with screen FDI. There are many more. Um, but it's based on experience of quite a large number of deals, I would say, that um, we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and there are some jurisdictions 
which I would call the regular enforcers. It probably started all with CFIUS, and, and I know that you will cover this um, at the end of this first part of the webinar and talk about latest CFIUS trends. Uh, about 10 years ago, this wave swapped over to Europe, um, and some jurisdictions started out there becoming very aggressive on um, FDI, my home jurisdiction, Germany, being one of them. Um, France, Italy, Spain, uh, all very much also in the wake of the um, COVID crisis uh, have tightened these controls. And certainly, um, last but not least, um, the UK, which only last year um, put its NSI regime in place. And since then, in my practice at least, has, won, has become one of the main um, jurisdictions which, which we look at. And outside Europe, um, there are a couple of other places which you regularly see. Um, I just mentioned one, which is Australia. The um, third jurisdiction is, is very experienced. It uh, can easily kick in if you meet certain thresholds. Uh, that's certainly also something to, to keep in mind. Um, the second category, with, which I have marked here in, in orange, is uh, one which you'll probably find interesting is China. Um, not so much from the perspective of Chinese acquisitions, but from international deals and whether they trigger FDI filings in China, which is not that often the case. Unlike merger control, where we see uh, filings in China quite a lot, um, FDI filings in China happen less frequently, so that's why it's not on the list of the red countries here. Canada currently is uh, still orange. Uh, Canada is revising its uh, FDI laws. It's orange because most of the deals that I see actually do require filing, but it's a post-closing filing in Canada. So that's less of an issue for the transactions. And then last but not least, you have the um, blue uh, jurisdictions here, which again, this is just a snapshot of a few. There are many more, but there are a couple of jurisdictions which you would recognize as typical business hubs where companies have holding companies, for instance, in the Netherlands, in Ireland, in Luxembourg, in Belgium, these are all either coming into force in the course of this year, 2023. Um, Belgium, uh, for instance, where Francesco and I practice will uh, come into force in July, so not too long to go. And also traditional kind of free economic places like Switzerland or Sweden are now uh, contemplating or planning to put new rules into place. So you can really see it's a, it's a me too exercise here, so to say. It's so interesting. And as we think about jurisdictions, of course, there's the overlay of trends, uh, whether they be by sector or otherwise. It, it, it seems to me that where historically FDI seemed to be focused on national security considerations in a very traditional model of borders, aerospace and defense, the trend, the key trend here seems to be pointing to broadening um, into other areas that are now deemed to be a national security concern. Would you agree with that? that that's exactly right, Mavish. And we can go to the next slide where um, I can talk you a bit through what I see here. As you say, when I started out, which uh, is a couple of years ago, um, in Germany, you had to file basically transactions in the military and defense space, and there was no other filing requirement. And then step by step, more and more sectors came in. I think the first one that we've seen in many countries is what you could consider critical infrastructure. So that's electricity grids or electricity production, telecommunication networks, harbors, um, airports, these types of things. Um, and then in line with technological development, this has transitioned more and more into what I would call um, FDI for critical technology. So you have critical infrastructure and critical technology. And at the intersection or covering it both, if you want, uh, is also software that you could use for either of those two. So if I just mention those critical technology, that could be artificial intelligence, that could be drones, that could be robotics, that could be encryption technology. There's quite a lot that, you know, most companies will one way or the other have to deal with because that's what every single sector of the economy moves into. And then we should not forget one aspect for FDI. Yes, it's a legal procedure and it has you know, it resembles to a certain extent other regulatory filings that you that you do, but it's also a political process. And uh, that's, I think, what you also see here on, on my slide. When you're uh, filing for a clearance, you need to consider if a given country where you have to notify has a particular interest in a company or in a sector 
And we saw that last year here in Europe when uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine started, the energy sector traditionally was looked at from the perspective of critical infrastructure, right? Whether you had a, an, a grid or so. But now as the dependency on Russian oil and gas became so obvious and the, the need for transition into renewables became even more urgent here, we see a lot more focus on aspects um, in the energy field, including into e-mobility, uh, you know, uh, electric vehicles, battery technology, these types of things. So it is something where, you know, you, you just need to follow the headlines in the newspapers and then you, you get a bit of an idea um, where things are going. And this requires um, that the advice or the thinking about uh, such transactions is not only legal, as I said, but also considers political aspects, being close to government. Um, so when I handle these things, I really work together with my colleagues from the public policy teams in London, in, in Washington, in, in Germany, so that we can help clients to understand if there's a particular topic that they need to have in mind. One of the other things that really strikes me on this uh, slide, Falk, is the percentages. I mean, as a deal lawyer, most of us naturally think about change of control in M&A transactions as triggering FDI considerations in what seems to be the new normal and continuing normal. But here it seems that for all transaction types, including joint ventures and minority equity investments and 10% or lower, we also need to consider at the FDI regime. Can you give us an overview of these, what seem to be what might be traps for the unwary and these alternative deal-making structures? Yeah, I, I would try that, Mavish. And indeed, it um, may sound counterintuitive if we say 10% or even lower, um, where could the security issue be? From the perspective of those in government or parliament who enact these laws, they are thinking, um, for instance, about information rights that you might acquire even if you're a minority shareholder uh, or stake building so that you have um, somehow an influence below control levels that could already be problematic if the company as such um, is in a critical sector. So that's why minority acquisitions uh, are something that um, can really play a, play a major role. And um, I mean, it depends really on the jurisdiction. Um, sometimes it's 10%, sometimes it's 20%. Some jurisdictions like um, Australia can even go uh, into the level of zero if you have a national security um, uh, business that is affected. The other thing um, which you see on the slide, internal reorganizations, probably the most <laughs> overlooked uh, part of the deal where I don't know how many filings have been missed. and. Um, I'm also uh, surprised when, when I heard about this first. Um, if you prepare for a deal and you probably carve out a business in the seller's organization, nothing changes at the ultimate beneficial owner level. There are some jurisdictions which would require you to make a filing if such business was security relevant. Um, I just mentioned the UK here because that comes up quite often. Uh, in Italy, that can be the case. In Austria, it can be the case. So that is something many jurisdictions say you know, internal regulations, that's not important for us, but some do. So uh, it, it just requires a very careful um, look at. And then, you know, thinking uh, or putting myself in your shoes, Mavish, as a deal lawyer, uh, there are also no exemptions, uh, for instance, for public uh, deals, right? It's not only when you have all the time in the world to, to um, prepare for a deal, do your analysis. Um, if there's a public takeover, I've seen it many times that the German Ministry of Economics reaches out to the parties if it reads about a transaction in the newspapers and, and says, hey, I've read in chambers or something that you have been advising on um, on a deal of that party a uh, year before. Are you in charge here? So they're really trying to get hold of these things. And last but not least, um, the stake building. You may think you're safe because you already have control and you already have 50% or so, but in some jurisdictions, you may need to go and file again if you increase um your uh, your stake, which that would be kind of my summary here, and I want to turn it over to to Anne then for some serious observations. But for me, it means deal makers are really well advised to um, connect upfront with the regulatory lawyers and not come, you know, when the deal is signed and say, can you now find out where to file because you might have actually missed something or your timing may be off. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, it's really part of the use at the outset, just like you would think about merger controls and tax structuring, you have to think about FDI. That's my big takeaway from your overview, whether it's an internal transaction or an external or a follow on. Um, so let's shift gears, as you suggested, to CFIUS, to Anne, and talking about headlines, even overnight, we've seen a lot of activity around CFIUS. <laughs> and maybe we can start with inbound investments. What can you share with us about what's going on and what what, what we should be looking out for? Sure. Thanks, Mavesh, and hello, everyone. Um, you know, it's been a hugely busy number of past several years for CFIUS. Um, the committee has been around for a long time, as many of you know, but it's only recently come into the spotlight. Um, and with some very public transactions. It used to be when I was there that it was referred to in the press as, quote, obscure, quote, secretive, uh, that little known panel of government officials. But I have to say that's not true anymore. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. And, and frankly, um, some of the trends that Falk just identified are, are similar to the, the trends we also see in the CFIUS area. Um, I'm just going to mention, in the interest of time, four quick points. Uh, the first is that with the uh, implementation of the new law, which was passed a couple of years ago, uh, which we call by short firma, um, there was, there's been an extraordinary increase in filings with the committee. It, it reviewed, I think, 460, just over 460 filings in 2021, huge increase from 2020. Um, a number of those uh, notices, long-form notices, went into the second stage of investigation, making them uh, review for a longer period. Um, so I think there are always hiccups when you, you have a new regime put in place, but I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, the Herculean effort on the part of the CFIA staff in making this implementation work, and also practitioners. Um, so we, I mentioned the increase in filings. The second thing that I would mention as a recent development is the CFIUS executive order issued in fall of 2022. Um, and for those of us who work pretty much every day in this space, we weren't too surprised by this, but I think it's important really for the public writ large to understand the focus that CFIUS has on some new things that really don't relate to the traditional old defense uh, related issues. And those are personal data, AI, biotech, quantum computing. Um, and also I think this executive order served to put President uh, Biden's stamp on the CFIUS process in some way. A couple of key takeaways from that EO, economic security can drive national security, but importantly, it's not an economic analysis. Two, transactions may not be viewed just in isolation. In other words, your transaction may be viewed in connection with other transactions in the same sector by other foreign persons. Uh, three, supply chain risks are not just worried, government is not just worried about defense related supply chain risks. For example, um, vaccines, the supply chain related vaccines could be an important risk. And finally, threats to technological leadership can implicate uh, national security. So while CFIUS's uh, mandate is really narrowly focused on national security risk, it's clear that certain economic factors such as technological leadership uh, and competition can rise to the level of creating a national security risk. Um, the third uh, point I want to mention is there are new uh, recently issued uh, enforcement guidelines and uh, those are have been long awaited. They pretty much say what you think they might say. Uh, CFIUS has not traditionally enforced a lot, but we do expect that going forward. And finally, uh, the last takeaway I want to mention, uh, a recent development I want to mention is biotech. Um, there is a great focus, and this is also this is largely in connection with Chinese transactions, but it also can be in connection with other uh, acquirers' transactions. Um, it, I think it's clear that the government is now thinking differently about the potential for disease to rise to national security harm and may uh, have and does have now additional scrutiny on these kinds of biotech deals. Uh, the key trend, uh, next uh, slide please. And quickly, I'm just going to go through this. Key trends, increased focus on non-notified transactions. Those are transactions where CFIUS reaches out ask questions of a completed transaction, and then potentially ask for a filing. Lots of inquiries of small investments in early stage tech companies, 
broad interpretation of its jurisdiction, focus on mitigation compliance and enforcement, and focus on what we call TID US businesses. These are businesses that are involved in critical technologies, critical infrastructure, and sensitive personal data. Over to you, <laughs> Francesca. And Francesco, as we pivot from the US to the EU, I'll tee up a similar question for you that I've posed to Falk and Anne. What, what are the protectionist trends that you're seeing in the EU? What are the headlines? Um, and help us parse through the chaos, please. Thank you, Mavesh. I I think that when we when we think about the EU and the protectionist approach, which is in a way something weird to think about because Europe, I mean, at least and, you know, in the last couple of decades has been strongly focused about, you know, liberal approach and, and, uh, and so it's, it's interesting to see how they're following kind of a carrot and stick approach to everything we see here, right? The carrot is basically the fact that there is a strong relaxation of the state aid rules. You may be familiar with it, but basically there are some rules in Europe that require member states to ask for an authorization to the commission before giving money to companies. And that may be complicated, obviously, make, make investments from outside Europe very complex and, you know, create a lot of red tape. And so the Europe is making it simpler to move to Europe and make an investment and receive money from the member states. The stick is always what we're talking about here. So it's reacting to the subsidies from third countries, from countries outside Europe. And the FSR we'll be talking about now, the foreign subsidies regulation, is meant to achieve that. Essentially, if you get money to make up an investment outside Europe and then you can't compete in Europe, your life will be a lot more difficult than if you made an investment in Europe and get money in Europe. So I think this carrot and stick sometimes is, is, not, is overlooked by people. And it's a key point to actually look at how the protectionism is being implemented in Europe. And I think that's, you know, these are some of the headlines that show why is this perceived as necessary. Right. As I said, attracting investment in Europe by giving more money to companies here and at the same time challenging or how can I say attacking those companies and instead receive money from outside Europe. I think we can move to the next slide, which allowed me a bit to explain better what this foreign subsidies regulation is. Well, the key word really is foreign subsidies, where both foreign and subsidies are essential. Um, Essentially, it's an extremely broad definition. It covers all kinds of financial contribution, be them direct or indirect. A direct contribution can be, um, um, let's say, China giving you a direct grant of a billion or a million or 50 million. Um, an indirect contribution could be a tax exemption, for example. So it can, it's really large. At the same time, there are some concepts that actually come from the existing the existing state aid rules in Europe, such as this idea of the specific, you know, as you read the slide, it must confer a specific an advantage or benefit specific to the undertaking, and it must distort competition within the European Union. Those are all concepts we're familiar with, both under the state aid rules and under merger control rules. So they're not entirely new. And they and they do give some space to, but I'll get to that in a moment, but they do give some space to, to, to us to actually try to navigate the complexity of understanding what is in and outside this new regulation. The target here is very much undertakings, right? Private or public engaging in economic activities in the European Union, which is very important here. Obviously, if you don't do business in Europe, then you're not concerned by this regulation. And I may add that I think that from what we learned, what we heard in the press, um, the political, I mean, the real politi politic target is really China. Um, Vestager, is, Vestager is the European uh, commissioner, is the commissioner of competition in Europe, basically the highest authority for competition law in Europe. And she literally said that China is the target of this FSR because apparently, according to the commission's data, China has been giving twice the amount of subsidies than Europe has given in the past. And specifically in sectors very strategic, such as the clean energy sector and the technological sectors. But it's also important to note that the FSR is not just about China. And because of the focus of this webinar, I, I like to say that, you know, speaking to reporters in Washington, um, Commissioner Vestager expressly said that subsidies that are given in the United States will be relevant for the implementation to notify under this new regulation. So 
it's about China to a large extent, but not only. So you need to be careful and watch out for what's coming. I think in terms of regulatory weapons, I'll get to it in a moment a bit more into detail, but basically the FSR is built by three blocks. One main block is about notification requirements in case of certain transactions. This is very much complementary to the current existing merger control rules and foreign direct investment rules that we've been speaking about. The second block is about public procurement. So when you do a public procurement in Europe, under certain circumstances, which I describe here, you are required to make a notification to the contracting authority, which itself will have to do notification to the commission. And last but not least, there is a power for the commission to do an investigation on its own motion, ex officio, as they say in Latin. Let me unpack a bit more of these three blocks, uh, maybe to help understand a bit better. When it comes to the transaction, this is very similar indeed to what we have in merger control. When you are doing a certain kinds of transaction, they, and we're talking about quite big uh, transactions, as you can see from the thresholds, right? The acquired company or one of the merging parties or the JV must generate at least 500 million in, the, in Europe, and there must be a certain amount of financial contributions involved you're obliged to make a notification to the commission, the European commission, and notify indeed the financial contributions received and wait for the commission to give the green light before you can implement it. Gun jumping exposes, so essentially failing to notify gun jumping exposes companies to significant fines. So it's very important to make sure to comply with this. Essentially the same logic applies when we talk about public procurement albeit that there it's really about participating in a tender proceedings in a procurement in Europe. And in that scenario, again, there is an estimated contract value above which you're required to do notification. And to be honest, I think this, this estimated contract value is actually pretty low in the, in the sense it will catch a lot of import, a lot of procurements in Europe. There are some exceptions. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm happy to provide more detail if helpful to anyone who's interested. But for example, in the defense sector, a lot of procurement is entirely exempted from this requirement. And last, the investigation. I like to say a couple of words about this because a lot of people are focusing on notifications, which is obviously really important. But the investigations will also be the way that the European Commission envisages to actually tackle everything that is not caught by these requirements and I think it will be largely drawn from in the, essentially what happens today for state aid, right? If China is granted to a company active in Europe a billion to do activities here, the commission, if this money has been given within a certain time frame, essentially 10 years from the start of the investigation, the commission can look into it and can adopt very significant redressive measures. Maybe let's go even a bit further into the procedure without annoying anyone about it, but I think it's important to grasp the level of the level of scrutiny that we're looking at here. Essentially, how the procedure will work in case of notification for transactions and public procurement is again very similar to what we know and what we're used to work with under the existing EU competition rules. Two phases: a preliminary review and an in-depth investigation. The preliminary review and in-depth investigation have some set timing. I think, I personally think this is a um, very ambitious timeline for the commission to comply with. I don't know whether they will actually manage to make it so that in 25 working days from notification, you know, that they will manage to get to a decision, but, but we can, I mean, <laughs> we'll have to see what happens in practice. But just, just to give you an idea of the fact that because of the FSR, now, when you're doing a deal, you have to take into account some additional extra time to deal with this as well. The obligation to notify will apply as of 12 October, so for a deal that will be closed after that date. However, and I move now to my, I ask to move to the next slide. However, please keep in mind indeed that compliance needs to start now, and you need to start right now to think about exactly, I mean, essentially, what kind of contributions have you received in the past, especially in the past three years that could qualify under this regulation would require you to make a notification? Right now, that is, I understand, a very, very difficult task. Now, the silver lining here is that some near, I mean, the commission 
essentially is, is planning to adopt a revised implementing regulation within July this year that will hopefully make it a little bit more simple for companies to identify what needs to be reported, what doesn't need to be reported under the FSR. And specifically, one of the main objectives is to narrow down the scope of the notification requirement and to increase the thresholds to what I write here. So only if individual amount will exceed 1 million compared to the current 200,000 euro and fall into a category listed in the draft, will the company be required to make a notification? I think my suggestion for companies would be really to start indeed working on, on tracking and recording all this financial contribution, mostly as an accounting quantitative exercise and really identify what is below this threshold. And then as a second step, work with experts, people who are used to work with the state aid rules, with the EU competition rules, and which can help you to identify what of those Sub, for financial contribution subsidies above the thresholds are likely to be caught under the new rules. That's Another, so, sorry. So it, that's so interesting, Francesco, because I see a theme here, both in terms of the regulations as well as some of the best practices you're identifying, which is the need to put an internal mechanisms in place. And it seems to me not only for this piece of it and leaked information, but the for, the, the subsidies and tracking all of that. Can you share a, a suggestion or two with some of um, the audience as to what you're seeing as, as best practices or suggestions or recommendations for those internal mechanisms? I think our first suggestion is to try to leverage as much as possible the existing compliance mechanisms that the companies have in place, not to create another kind of general data protection uh, disaster <laughs> that happened in the last couple of years. So that's why my first suggestion. The second one is indeed to start working with those in the company that are competent and, and you know able to identify what is coming in from identified for countries. So we're talking about state authorities at every level. It can be a municipality, it can be a regional, it can be a state, it can be a federal entity, anything that is public money. And as a second step indeed, try to work out with probably the help of competition lawyers, whether indeed, whether indeed some of those need to be notified under the FSR. I think Falk has something to add or yeah, let's 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 hear Falk's answer to to that broad question of any best practices or what you might be suggesting to our clients of internal mechanisms that um, ought to be in place. I mean, on the internal mechanisms, I I couldn't agree more. Um, if you think about where is the Commission currently in this game, this is not only new for all of us here, for the panelists, for the uh, audience, and the companies who need to prepare. It's also new for the Commission, and they first will need to find. Um, people who can work on these cases. So it's not that as of the date when this goes live, there will be, you know, 100 investigations at a time. So I want to say I, I would keep it kind of reasonable. That said, for compliance, it makes total sense to think about what do we already have and how can could we improve that? And I think uh, one of the questions that came in via the chat goes into a similar direction. What about transaction documents? Um, what, what do we, how do we need to implement FSR and also FDA, all these new regulatory tools in, in a, a transaction document? Is this now, let's say, something we need to consider um, when we're having an SBA as a condition precedent? And I think the answer is yes. And we, we have seen that, of course, in recent years already with FDI, that um, the analysis of which conditions precedent to closing do we have have just become much broader than in the past. You know, in the past, you had your typical HSR clause and probably one or two foreign merger filings. And now I uh, see more and more often that we have categories like merger control, investment control. Um, and I guess uh, we would now have for the deals that meet the 500 million turnover in, in Europe, which is also not every deal, but the larger international deals clearly fall into this. Yes, you'll, you'll need to consider both a provision on a condition precedent, but also covenants, how you cooperate in, in doing the filing. And then I think um, probably on, on timing, Francesco, back to you, because this, this is also relevant here, um, I guess, for deals. 
yeah, I just I just wanted to add in terms of very concrete next steps, what is happening now. As I said, July will be key to see the new implementing regulation, and that will give a lot more guidance on what needs to be notified to the Commission. So wait for it. We'll definitely be following up and we'll be happy to take any questions. And then in the next year, we'll get more guidelines from the Commission on the substantive assessment the Commission did plan to do. And there again, you know, there will be a lot of food for thought we'll be happy to help you with. Thank you, Francesco. Speaking of things to keep an eye out for, let's go back to Anne and this time talk about what's being dubbed as reverse CFIUS, so outbound investments from the U.S. to other countries. Um, share with us your knowledge and what we should be looking out for. Thanks, Mavesh. Uh, you know, the bottom line is we ought to be looking out for a lot in this area, frankly. Um, so as Mavesh mentioned, we've thus far been talking about inbound vetting, um, investment screening vetting, which is what CFIUS does. Uh, but what is on the table now is a switch of gears and, and people are talking about, about, an, about an, a mechanism for screening outbound investments. And this regime could involve the establishment of a new interagency committee similar to CFIUS uh, to review investments by U.S. persons, U.S. companies, in companies from strategic and adversarial competitor countries, read China or Russia. Um, some, as Mavesh mentioned, have referred to this as reverse CFIUS. It's not absolutely clear uh, what that mechanism will be, whether it will involve an interagency committee or not, but it's very possible. Um, we expect that there's going to be an executive order or an EO that will be issued establishing this mechanism very shortly, maybe in as, as soon as a couple of weeks. Um, and later on, I think uh, Falk will talk a little bit about the coordination that the U.S. is engaging in with the Europeans on this front. Um, but for now, just to know that the idea has broad bipartisan support in Congress and also from the executive branch, though there are differences in the views about how each views this mechanism, um, it's currently expected that the EO, once issued, will be followed uh, by legislation that will flesh out the regime. So why is this necessary? Uh, and what is the rationale for the, the, the proposal? And, and the rationale, the objective of it is to address concerns that the U.S. government has um, in U.S. investments in advanced technology sectors of strategic competitors. And the fact that that, that funding of development of technology is harming U.S. national security. Um, so, if there and in a, in the way that this technological development could be enhancing other countries' military capabilities, and thereby undermining U.S. technological leadership and competitive advantage, um, I, I think that it's fair to say that the the U.S. Um, views the outbound regime as is another tool in the toolkit. Uh, to which would include economic sanctions, export controls, and CFIUS to address uh, the U.S.-China uh, situation. Um, I think there's also a concern just to add about supply chain security here. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So I think um, it's important to note right now that we don't know the full details of this regime. Um, they're still under discussion. And of course, with something like this, the devil is going to be in the details. Um, so it's not possible to know with precision how it will apply. And particularly, we don't know exactly which entities it will apply to yet or which transactions will be covered. Having said that, we have some reasonable sense of where it's headed. Um, and let me just quick th quickly tick through these in the interest of time. We think Treasury will have a, a lead role in this at, in coordination with Commerce and other federal departments. Um, it's possible that, as I mentioned, it could be patterned on CFIUS, uh, but it may not be. Um, it is expected to be narrowly tailored in terms of uh, scope with emphasis on investments that are on key sensitive industries such as semiconductors, AI, quantum computing, supercomputers. Also, those areas would have to have a clear nexus to U.S. national security and could enhance um, and basically the last uh, the last uh, criteria would be that they would not otherwise be captured by existing uh, national security authorities such as export controls. Um, it's possible that this regime could include 
either the prohibition of a narrow subset of technologies or a notification, a sort of notify and go uh, process uh, with respect to these technologies. Uh, another key question that's arisen is to whether or not the, what types of activities investments will be covered. In particular, whether passive investments and non-passive investments would be covered, or whether only non-passive investments might might be covered, such as in such as having a board seat or uh, having uh, coming along investment coming along with management expertise or similar know-how. Um, certain of the of the the uh, the uh, remarks that Commerce Secretary has made suggest that non-passive investments and private equity will be the focus, but what will ultimately be covered and whether the regime will extend to minority and passive investments or whether there will be shareholding thresholds, uh, we, don't, we don't know for certain. Um, it is possible and we think likely that the initial approach will, will involve a pilot program, uh, which will uh, serve to provide the government with information uh, and inform future actions. This was something that was used in connection with this, the new CFIUS law that I think was used uh, to, good, uh, to good use by the government and, and the practitioners. Um, but Secretary uh, Raimondo, as she put it recently, quote, it makes sense to walk before you run because getting it wrong has consequences we want to avoid. So I think the US government is mindful that there are implications for US business with this approach. Um, it's also possible, it's also likely, we think, that there will be an opportunity for comment on proposed regulations in connection with the EO. Um, and I think that it's, um, it, it is important to understand that I think the U.S. government is mindful of the fact that there will be implications for U.S. industry with this approach. Um, slide 18. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the interest of time on this. This is a background. The, the important point here is that this is not a new debate. Um, in fact, uh, provisions that would have dealt with outbound uh, review of investments were in fact considered in connection with FIRMA, which was the CFIUS uh, regime that was put in place several years ago. Um, and then subsequent to that last year, there was legislation that was proposed that would have done something similar. Um, and I think those pr provisions never made it, uh, never passed. Um, and I, but I think it's safe to say that we now have a different environment. Um, next slide, please. And I just want to mention a couple of recent developments in this area. There was recently, I think, early May, uh, an updated legislation that was proposed by Representatives Delaro, Pascal, and Fitzpatrick in May of 2023. Uh, which is an updated version of what we saw last year's bill, but it's it's different. And at a high level, without going into details, the bill establishes an interagency committee called the Committee for National Critical Capabilities. Um, certain critical sectors have been added, such as pharmaceutical ingredients and automobile manufacturing. Um, and there, uh, so it, it's different in a way. Uh, but I think that it's it's yet another sort of uh, this legislation is being thrown into the ring to be able to to uh, be part of the policy debate on Capitol Hill regarding how this will ultimately uh, play out. Um, I think it's our, still our best guess that there will be an EO that's issued before legislation, but that legislation will ultimately flesh out the contours of the of the regime. Um, I think the other second development, and I've just, we've included a letter from Representative Patrick McHenry. It's on the next slide. Thanks. Um, this is, you can take a, take a look at it, but it was just issued the other day on May 25th. Um, uh, Representative McHenry is asking uh, some key questions uh, regarding the outbound regime and the authority to support it. Uh, next slide, please. So, for this group, I think it's important to, to talk about what are the important considerations for US companies. And I think that, um, I think that it, is, um, it is clearly the case that it will affect US companies, um, and, but we don't know yet exam the entire sort of, what should I say, the entire panoply of how it's going to work yet until we see the EO. Uh, 
For example, if, a, if the UK arm of a US private equity fund invests in a Chinese AI company, would that investment be covered? Very technical questions such as that. I think that the administration will try to balance uh, the benefits to US national security of such a regime with the potential adverse effects. Um, and I think the other point to mention is that the US has been very uh, uh, focused on consulting with the private sector, um, particularly the financial and technology sectors to try to find that right balance. So at a high level, um, there are things that US companies ought to expect here. Um, first of all, if something is put in place, there will be a, a period of regulatory uncertainty as both the government and the private sector navigate the new rules. There will be compliance costs because U.S. companies will have to assess whether or not these investments are covered. Um, and I think that at this stage, even though we don't have a final, uh, we don't have a final regime yet, um, it is uh, a good idea to take a look at your, it may be a good idea to take a look at your exposure to Russia and China, to closely monitor these developments, and also really importantly, consider commenting on, uh, there will be the EO and likely proposed regulations. Consider commenting on those because in connection, certainly in connection with the, the CFIUS legislation some years back, that was an important part in helping to shape the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, regime. Um, I think that's, there are also other things that one could undertake, such as taking a look at contractual provisions uh, and also um, seeing whether or not it makes sense to consider different strategies for investment, but I won't go into detail with those. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide talks about uh, two additional points to think about. In addition to the challenges that the regime might pose for U.S. companies, critics have highlighted that the outbound regime could undermine rather than strengthen the U.S. competitive edge. Uh, and this could be true, for example, um, if U.S. companies and the U.S. government it were to lose insight into the Chinese development, for example, of certain advanced technologies and vulnerabilities or gaps in the development of those technologies. And I think the final point um, here, and, and Falk will, will also uh, elaborate on this, is that if other countries do not follow the U.S. in putting place an outbound mechanism, will that, does that undermine the threat? In other words, will the effect of it be muted if allies do not put in place similar mechanisms? Because really what could happen is if the U.S. stops funding, it is very possible that foreign money could come in its place. Now, I think that the U.S., or I know that the U.S. government has been in, in discussions with the EU and the European countries uh, on this topic. Uh, so I think with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Falk uh, for some late breaking um, developments on this very topic. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, I think we're going to the next slide. Well, um, seems like an offer not to decline and when the U.S. asked its allies to also consider an outbound investment, I have to say, um, when I heard about this first, I wasn't quite sure how it would translate, um, but it seems to be, again, uh, something where this political power play that we already discussed um, about in the FDI side comes to the air. So only a few weeks ago, when the G7 summit uh, took place in uh, Hiroshima, in, I think it was in mid-May, um, outbound investment made it into the um, final declaration of that um, meeting. So not in a concrete form that, you know, uh, there would be an obligation to implement such rules. But the G7 leaders did say that everyone agrees that um, one should consider what they call appropriate measures to address risk from outbound investments. Now, that leaves the door open for the U.S. to go ahead with an EO and for um, others, in particular the EU, to follow. But it's interesting that it's um, really senior uh, government officials who come out on this topic. So you see that the president of the European Commission, um, Sonia Line, has commented uh, already back in March that um, she's considering for the Commission whether Europe would need an outbound investment tool too. 
I think we really don't have anything comparable in terms of details as the U.S. has right now with concrete proposals. Um, it is uh, clear, I think, that this would be something that would be aligned very closely with the U.S. approach. So therefore, presumably pretty targeted to certain technologies. And I think, Anne, you referred earlier to uh, semiconductors, which I think is uh, clearly some of the sectors that I could see of interest um, to Europe as well. Uh, the kind of latest that we have um, is indeed the uh, EU-US Trade and Technology Council, which um, took place the last two days. So this morning, you can read in the newspapers all over Europe, at least, and presumably also in the States, that um, the final communication there uh, has, again, outbound investment um, included. It was on the agenda. And the statement basically says the EU and the US recognize that appropriate measures designed to address risks from outbound investment could be important to complement existing tools of targeted um, export controls or investment controls. So the other topics that we, we've discussed before. Uh, it doesn't come totally surprising if you think about the close alignment in the security space, for instance, on export controls. I mean, both the US, Europe, and other jurisdictions follow an international agreement, the Bassanar Agreement, uh, to implement their national export control rules. Also, in the uh, foreign investment control space, I think, and we see some coordination between CFIUS and European allies on uh, screening jurisdictions, merger control, not security related, uh, also a long tradition of the government's cooperating. So if there is outbound control in the US, I think it's pretty logical that uh, there is an attempt to to coordinate. Um, and interestingly, that is backed by a, a number of, uh, I would say, people who, who have a say in this. So uh, you see here that um, the German vice chancellor uh, also basically simply said, um, I think we should do the same. So we, we should implement rules. We don't have outbound investment yet. Um, that's an interesting statement to be made, by the way, from a member state, because Trade policy in Europe is something that should actually or is normally dealt with at union level. So there will be an, a legal question um, that I don't suggest you go into here, um, whether national member states could actually implement something at all. But clearly there is political support, not, not so much visibility yet on what it would be. But that means, to, to sum up from the European perspective, um, if you go ahead and in the US and we see an EO in the next few weeks, the pressure will clearly increase on the EU uh, and on member states or from member states on the European Union to, to do something and to, to have a plan so that um, there is a coherent response to that. That would be kind of my uh, short summary from the European government perspective, so to say. It's so interesting, Falk and Anne and Francesco. I mean, it, it, it really underscores how interrelated not only our global businesses are, but the regulations that encompass them, regardless of where they may be headquartered or located, given this domino effect, it seems, that um, of changes in regulations and the ripple effect, because the underlying concerns seem to be very consistent protectionist concerns, the, the push and pull between wanting to keep our markets and economies open for investment and for different types of transaction types, while at the same time balancing considerations and protections um, from a national security or geopolitical perspective. So we'll be watching very, very closely. Um, I, I know we've gotten some questions come in. We might not have time to do more than one, but perhaps a quick one that came in, Falk, while you we were talking earlier about conditions pre, um, precedent to put in documents. Uh, the question was, you know, do all of these topics end up being closing conditions in the transaction agreements, or is there another way that people are dealing with it? Um, and, and for the rest of the questions, we will make sure that we get back in writing to you all. But perhaps we can take that one, Valk, really quickly from at least an EU perspective. What are you recommending deal lawyers like myself do um, with some of these matters? Yeah, I think we, we've touched on that a bit earlier already, Mamesh, right? This is the, the point where I said, I think the answer in short is yes. Um, these are not rules where you can say, hey, it's just politics, we can disregard them. They'll make their way into transaction documents, they'll become closing conditions, they'll become covenants to cooperate, they'll become part of your D-lawyer's assessment, how long does it take us to close, 
and it may well be that it takes longer. I think too early to say for um, outbound investment, I guess um, that has some, some similarities both to export controls. So there might be more a question about compliance. Um, but depending on uh, how they structure the, the process of notifying, um, it could be something that, that also uh, requires being considered there. The only other comment I wanted to make, and I think we have one slide for that too, which we should move at the end, is all what we talked about here on outbound investment is not set in stone. Governments want it, but at least in Europe, um, as you see here on this slide, I'm not going to read it to you. The reaction is lukewarm to say the best. Um, so... I think European businesses really are very concerned about um, the European government following the US on this point. Um, I'm not sure that this will change anything, but we have seen, for instance, with the FSR, that very critical reaction from the European industry towards the Commission on the FSR has led to changes in these proposed implementing regulation that, Francesco, you referred to earlier. So uh, I think someone said this before, you, you can um, you can comment, you can participate in consultations uh, as a business if you want to shape this. And probably, Anne, you, you want to comment on that from the U.S. perspective, too. I mean, in the U.S., uh, I, I think the debate has been going on for, for a bit longer than here. Yes, absolutely. I, I think the, the most important point that you said is to to monitor and comment on these uh, these proposals where you can, uh, because, for example, in connection, maybe I mentioned this, but in connection with the CFIUS uh, regulations, that was very helpful to shape the outcome. Um, I think in terms of the U.S. industry response at the moment, certainly we are hearing concern, but I think ultimately it's going to depend on the on the uh, the terms of the or the language in the EO and just what it covers. I think that um, if um, if it is more narrowly constructed um, and principled in 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 basically. Um, uh, addressing national security concerns, I think there, that that there will be more support there. So back to you, Mavesh. <laughs> well, th that is fascinating. I think the sum total of this is look out. <laughs> this is a space to watch and very closely if you're doing any sort of transaction really in any part of the world, whether it's in um, um, triggering merger control or in its investment, a joint venture, or even an internal reorg as we heard today, you must be thinking about FDI in addition to merger control and everything else. And, and we at Hogan Lovells would be delighted to help answer any questions you have. Um, so without further ado, um, the CLE code, which might be what some of you are waiting for, it's right there on the screen. Beach House 2023 seems apt for June 1, perhaps the kickoff of summer. Um, and on behalf of Hogan Lovells and our wonderful panelists, we thank you for joining us today. We will follow up um, with all the participants after this meeting um, for any Q&A that you had put in that we didn't have time to get to. Um, we'll also send you a link to the webinar. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.